Hey guys, it's Jacqueline here. Uh, welcome to HSM Online. I know that it looks a little bit different, um, but as we get ready to hear a message from Pastor Sawyer, we're going to dive into a time of worship. So I would just encourage you right now, wherever you're at, um, to just give yourself some space and worship as you feel led, because God in this season and through all seasons is still worthy of all of our praise um, and all of the glory. So as we get ready to worship, let's pray together. Lord, thank you, God, um, that you are good, and thank you, God, that um, no matter the situation that we're in, Lord, um, that you are worthy and that you are making a way for us. So thank you, Lord, that um, through the thick and thin, um, you still work miracles, and God, you are still the light in the darkness that um, is worthy of following. So we love you and we praise you and uh, we give this worship and this night to you in Jesus name. Amen. you are here. You never stop, you never 
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Come on, we sing. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even. When Stay true to that. Lord, we love you and we praise you from wherever we're at tonight. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is up, HSM? So excited to be back with you tonight. I'm officially back in California back at the church recording. They have been nice enough to open up the doors to me to let me record this week and keep in social distancing. But so I'm super excited to be back in here and also to be back in California with you guys. If you don't know, I was in Alabama uh, for about a week with Jordan. We went and spent some time with my family to celebrate my little sister's wedding, which was super cool to be a part of. I got to officiate that. That was a lot of fun. And then also we were there for Jordan's birthday. Um, I just said Jordan, like my niece says her name. She can't say Jordan, so she says Jordan. Anyway, it was Jordan's birthday, uh, so if you haven't gotten a chance to, make sure you wish her a belated happy birthday in the comment section. Um, but while we were there for her birthday, we couldn't do a whole lot because of quarantine and the wedding and all that stuff. So one of the things Jordan wanted to do all week was let's just sit and relax and watch some movies. So Jordan being Jordan and me being me, we watched some of those old classic Disney movies on Disney Plus all week long. It was so much fun. And before you make fun of me for the movies that we watched, I just want to preface that these were her choices, okay? It was her birth week, so we got to watch whatever she wanted to watch. So we sat down on day one, and we actually watched The Princess Diaries. Now, I remember growing up and watching The Princess Diaries with my sisters or whatever, and I thought it was pretty good. I didn't think it was too bad. Um, and so I started kind of remembering this movie a little bit more. I was like, yeah, it's a good movie. And as we started watching it, I was kind of like, you know, this movie isn't as good as I remembered it being. I think as a kid, I got caught up in, you know, some of the, um, the stuff about the movie, like we do with every movies. But as I got older and as I started going back and watching some of these movies that I used to think was good as a kid, I just realized they're not that great anymore, right? I think we get caught up as kids watching some of these movies like Tarzan. My favorite movie character as a kid was Tarzan. I love him swinging through the trees and never wearing any shoes or a shirt. I thought that was so cool. But movies like that, you grow up and you kind of realize, okay, you know, maybe these stories are a little sloppy, like Princess Diaries, the acting's just terrible, I don't know. But that's why as kids, we get so consumed with that stuff, and then the older we get, we realize that the best movies are really the ones that do a good job of telling a story, right? Yeah, all movies tell a story, but let's be honest, there are some movies that tell stories better than Princess Diaries, like Lord of the Rings, one of my all-time favorite movies. Yeah, it's got some cool fight scenes in it and all that stuff, but ultimately, they tell a story really well. Because there's just something powerful about a good story. Right? Last week, we talked about 
the importance of the job that God gave us here on earth, that we have a job to go out and to tell others about God. And today we're going to talk about how to do that. We're going to talk about how God gave us the ability to use stories to tell people about God, specifically the stories of what God has done in our life. Now, a lot of people are really scared to do that, to go out to tell others about God, and I get that. Right? I think people are a little shy, a little weird, a little hesitant to go out and just to talk to people about God. But like we talked about last week, that's our job, right? It's what God put us here to do. And luckily in scripture, he actually shows us a really good way to do it. There's a lot of ways to go and talk to people about God. You can just talk about the things that you're learning. You can talk about church, whatever it is. But in scripture, God actually does it in a pretty specific way. It's really cool. And it's through stories. And using stories to tell others about God is easier than I think most of us might think. Today, we're going to look at one of those stories that God used to tell others about him all throughout the world. It's a story that most of us probably know. I've talked about it before. I've talked about it a lot. It's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. And it's the story of Moses, which is found in Exodus. In fact, right now, I'm reading through the book of Exodus with some of my guys. We're reading through it every single day. And we read one chapter a day, and we throw in uh, our group me a little thought that we learned. So right now, shout out to my boys, Allah, Andrew, Anthony, Brandon, Chris, Josh, Mahaley, Nathan, and Toby. You guys are awesome. I love reading through this story with you guys right now. But if you know this story of Moses that's found in Exodus, you know that there's kind of a lot of ups and downs, wins, losses, really cool things that happens. It's this crazy story. Basically, Moses is born as an Israelite, which they're slaves at the time to the Egyptians. And uh, the Egyptian pharaoh wanted to control the population of the slaves. So he basically sent up and said, hey, any, any Israelite under the age of two, male, go ahead and go ahead and kill him. Moses fit in that category. So Moses' mother put him in a basket, threw him down the, uh, down the Nile River. He survived crazy. He actually ended up in the house of the Pharaoh to be raised in the Egyptian household from the person who tried to kill him as a little baby. Then Moses grew up. He murdered a dude, straight up just killed him, ran away into the desert, became a shepherd. Then God appeared to him as a burning bush, said, hey, I'm going to use you to go to, to Pharaoh and free my people. Then God performs a bunch of miracles, uh, then frees his people from slavery, splits a river, sends them into the, uh, the desert, does all these crazy things. It's this crazy, crazy story. But in all of that, God had one specific reason for doing that. Yes, it's cool to see all that stuff, but the main reason is found in Exodus 9, and I want us to look at that. It says this in Exodus 9, 16. It says, but for this purpose, I have raised you up. Here, God is talking to Pharaoh. He says, for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. God's basically saying, hey, the reason that all this went down is so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Yes, it was cool to see God free the Israelites. Yeah, it's cool to see a guy like Moses do what he did. Yes, it was cool to see him perform miracles and do all this crazy stuff. But God has this underlying reason that he made it all happen. So that God's name could be proclaimed in all the earth. God had the ability, if he wanted to, to snap his fingers, and all of a sudden, it's done. His people are free, Pharaoh's dead, whatever. But he allowed it to go down so that Pharaoh might see his power, the Egyptians would see his power, the Israelites would see his power, and his name would be proclaimed in all the earth. In other words, proclaimed, what it basically means is, so the people who experienced him in those moments, they would go out and they'd tell the story about it. Those Egyptians who saw God do that stuff, they'd tell the story. Oh, did you see, did you hear about God and what he did? Those Israelites who were freed and experienced God in those moments would go out and say, did you hear about what our God did for us back there? And then as they're telling the story about what God did in their lives, other people would end up experiencing him. Other people through their stories would experience him. And that ultimately, it summarizes our lives. Life is going to take us on some wild ups and downs, wild rides. God will be there for us every single day, just like the Israelites, just like this story. But also just like the story, the underlying reason The job that he gives us with it is to use the story, to use our lives, to use our experiences, to go out and to tell others about him and what he's done in our lives. That's why he sent Moses to face Pharaoh. That's why he sent David to face Goliath. That's why he sent Jesus to face the cross. Yes, so that we could receive forgiveness and go to heaven. That's the main reason. 
but also so that that story would be told throughout the ages so that people would know that God is real. See, God uses our stories, the stories of the experiences that we have with him, to lead others to Christ. And it's our job to go out and to tell people about it. Just like we talked about last week, the importance of being compelled to talk about him. And that's what's important to understand here. Is that Moses, what he went through, it probably seemed pointless along the way, just like maybe this quarantine does. It was probably really hard on him, just like maybe school or bad relationships are. And it definitely was hard for him to do what God called him to do, which was to go into a season of uncertainty to tell Pharaoh about God and to free his people. But in the end, the story of Moses' life came back to lead others to Christ. Not only in the story did the people experience God, not only did those Israelites experience God, not only did the Egyptians experience God, but the people who ended up hearing the story experienced him too. It wasn't just the time, the moment, the place, those people that heard him. It was later on. Those Israelites, they went out and they told the story. Bro, did you hear about what God did to Pharaoh? Pharaoh's gone. It's like Pharaoh, oh no, he's gone. Like that's, that's, they told the story and they're like, people are like, really? That's crazy. You see, the power of a story goes way beyond just when it happened. The power of a story remains relevant as long as it's told. As long as a story is told, it remains relevant. It remains powerful. It always has weight to it. Right now, you and I, were on a journey. Quarantine, it's tough. School's hard, relationships suck, parents can be frustrating, annoying, whatever it may be. You are in a season, you are on a journey, you are doing something that the Lord has put you in, has called you to go do. I don't know what it is that you're going through, but I do know that God's doing something in you through it. I know that he's working something out in your life, just like he used Moses. See, God took Moses, he took someone who didn't belong there and used him to free his people, to free his nation. The nation of Israel that we know it happened because God used Moses to do it. God's also using you to do something huge right now. He's preparing you, he's sending you, he's equipping you, he's doing stuff, but more than anything, he's gonna use the story of this season that you're in and what he did for you and is doing for you in it to lead people to Christ. And that's what I'm getting at here. We all have stories. We all have experiences, we all have encounters with the Lord, and we're in them right now. And God is wanting us to go out and to share that with people. He wants us to take what we're going through right now and what God is teaching us and doing in us and showing us to go out and to share that with people. Now, that seems, I know that seems kind of daunting to, to, to a lot of us to have to talk to people about Jesus and to talk to them about our lives and what we're dealing with and what we're going through. Now, it shouldn't, but it does. It does seem daunting. And you're not alone in that, right? If you're scared to tell others about Jesus, if you're scared to talk about what's going on in your life, you're not alone in that, okay, at all. In fact, even in this story, Moses, when God sent him, he was actually scared too, believe it or not. He was scared. When God said, hey, you're going to go, he was scared. Look at Exodus 3 with me. This is at the beginning of the story when God appears to Moses in the burning bush and God says, hey, you're going to go and you're going to go to Pharaoh and you're going to tell him about me and you're going to free my people and perform these miracles, which also, by the way, confirms that our job is to talk to others about God and to tell people about who he is. But here God is sending Moses, and Moses is like, hold up. Right here in this verse, it says this. He says, God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God answered, I will certainly be with you. Now, I love right here that Moses' first concern is about his identity. Right, his first, his first fear, his first concern is like, hold up, God, like, who am I that I should go? I'm a murderer, right? At this point, all he is is a murderer and a shepherd. He's a runaway slave. Who am I that I should go? Who am I that you should send me? It's about his identity. It's about his self-worth. Anyone ever felt that way towards God? Anyone ever felt like you're not good enough to do what God's calling you to do or to even be in the presence of God? Right, maybe right now you're watching and you've been to HSM a couple of times and while you're there, maybe you felt God calling you. Maybe you felt him saying, hey, you got to come to me. And you were just like, um, I got to get some stuff right first. Right? I got to maybe stop drinking or stop smoking. I got to get this addiction under control. I got to stop cutting myself. I got to stop doing this with my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Maybe I just got to get this stuff right. Or maybe, maybe you came into HSM or whatever and you're like, if you only knew what I had done. If you only knew what I've done in this life. That's kind of what Moses is saying here, right? He's saying, God, you don't even know who you're trying to send. Like, you're crazy. 
if you only knew who I was, if you only knew what I had done, you would not be sending me. Who the heck am I that I should go? I, gotta, I got all this stuff to figure out on my own. You're telling me that you're going to use me to go out and to lead others to Christ? You're going to use me to go tell people about God? I'm, I'm cutting myself at night and you're going to use me to go tell people about God? I'm addicted to pornography. I can't go a single day without looking at it. And you're going to use me to go tell people about God? I, I can't go a single hour without sneaking out of class to get high so that I can get through the day and not have anxiety attacks. And you're going to use me to go talk about God? You see, we measure our self-worth with our accomplishments and our failures. But our worth doesn't come from that. Our worth doesn't come from what we have done and haven't done, our sin, our shortcomings. Our worth comes from the God who's with us who's sending us, and who gives us this job and this purpose regardless of what successes or failures that we've had in life. That's where our self-worth comes from. And we see that in God's answer, and it's so cool, God's response to Moses when he has this concern. God's response is so cool. He says this. It's, it's, it's not, hey, Moses, you're the best, so I'm sending you. It's not, hey, Moses, you're the strongest, so I'm sending you. It's not, hey, Moses, you've got it all figured out, so I'm going to send you. It's not, Moses, you know what? You're the best communicator, in fact, a lot of people think that Moses might have had a lisp or a speech impediment to go along with it. Not sure if that's true, but that is what a lot of people, because he talks about how Moses is wanting Aaron to speak for him. And you, know, you might be saying, well, Sawyer, I, I'm, I'm a leader. You know, I believe that my leadership capabilities will take me very far in life, and I'll make quite a difference in my community. That's great. I want you to be a leader. I want you to be great. I want you to do all those things. But what happens when, when God sends us into an area that we're not ready for, that's out of our comfort zone? What happens if you pride yourself in being a leader and God calls you to a season when you're called to follow another leader, but you're so prideful in a leadership that you can't follow him? I believe that one of the most important things that as leaders we can do is follow solid leadership as well. What happens when God calls you out of something into something that's out of your own ability? That's what he's doing to Moses here. Moses is great at a lot of stuff. He's a leader. He's a shepherd. He knows he's strong. He's courageous. But he's calling Moses out of his comfort zone. And that's why God, his answer is so powerful. It's not you're the best. It's not you're the brightest. It's this. I will certainly be with you. I'm going to be with you. See, our qualification doesn't come from what we're able to do, what we're unable to do, anything like that. Our qualification comes from the God who accompanies us. That's what you need to know, that you are accompanied. That's the first point. When you're going out to do this job, you need to know that you are accompanied by God, and that's where your qualification comes from. Look at Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. I love that. It's the challenge. Be strong and courageous. Why? Don't be terrified or afraid of them. Why? For the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. I've said this verse before. God is always going to be with you, and he will not leave you or abandon you. As God's calling you out to go and to do this job, he's with you. It doesn't matter where you go, what you do, who you're talking to, God's with you. It doesn't matter if you go into a classroom, there's a person sitting next to you that normally you don't talk to, and you want to talk to him, you want to reach out to him and just see how you're doing, you want to be bold and courageous, but you're scared, no, I don't want to get made fun of her, God's with you right there. You see, we go into this life, into our days, into our seasons, into our situations with this job to do, but so few of us do it. Why? I believe because it's, it's, we're not, we don't feel ready, we don't feel capable, we don't feel confident enough, strong enough, bold enough, brave enough, whatever it is, we don't want to get made fun of. We don't want to strike out and actually have them say no to us. I think the fear of getting rejected is a huge reason that a lot of us don't do this, don't talk about God. I believe that God is calling us in our everyday lives, in our classes, in our homes. I know a lot of you have parents, brothers, sisters who are not believers. Why aren't you reaching out to them? Why aren't you leading them to Christ? Why aren't you talking to them about God on a daily basis? Because you're scared. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just saying God's with you and he's calling you to do this. He's calling you to go and say, hey, so-and-so, hey, Sally, hey, Fred, hey, whoever it is, little Johnny, the Lord loves you. Hey, guess what God's done in my life? Hey, talk to him about God and what he's done in your life. You know what they're going through, especially people that are closest to you. They might be going through a season of depression. Hey, you know what, man, I... I know what you're going through, and I, I don't want to sit here and, and, and make you feel, you know, belittle your situation at all, but I do want to let you know I, I've been through something similar. I've, I've gone through kind of that season before, and it's really tough, and I know, I know what you're going through, and I'm, I just want to say I'm sorry. I know me saying that doesn't really help you, but I do want to say I got through it because of prayer and because of 
the people at my church and, and my God really came into my life and kind of turned me around and I don't want to pressure you in anything but it worked for me maybe it'll work for you I, would you want to come to church with me this Sunday this Tuesday this Wednesday right now we're in quarantine would you want to watch HSM you can even get it's so simple you can even give them a link hey I know you're struggling with addiction right now hey I know you're really mad at mom and dad hey I know you're going through this I know you're going through that I went through it too I know a friend who went through it too whatever it is you can relate through stories you see what I'm just getting at there it's a story of how God has done something or is doing something in your life currently and you can relate to someone through your story. And you can just send them, hey, hey here's, here's a message that I watched that really helped with me, that, that God really showed me that it's gonna be okay. Maybe you can try it out. You're accompanied by the Lord and he is sending you out to do this job. Be bold, be courageous, just like that verse says in Deuteronomy. How many times have we gone through a day and been like, felt at the end of it like, wow, I was strong and courageous today. Wow, that was a good day. I went out, I was strong, I was courageous, I was bold, I talked to people about God, I did what I was supposed to do, what a day. I feel like most of us get to the end of the day and we're just ready to go to sleep because we're glad that the day's over. And maybe we're struggling with anxiety about the next day. What if we started to live out this calling and it led to strength and courage and boldness that we've never had before? Maybe one of the reasons that you're so anxious is because you're not living out your purpose and you're not fulfilling the reason that God put you here. I believe that if we go out and do the job that God has called us to do, we'll start to acknowledge that God is with us and we'll start to be more bold and courageous and strong, just like that verse says. But then Moses goes into the how, right? So that was, he, he was talking about, you know, his self-worth and all that stuff. Now he goes into the how. He says, God, how, how am I going to do this, right? You, ex you expect him to listen to me? You expect him to just believe that God sent me? We see this in Exodus 4, when Moses, Moses answered him, God, what, what if they won't believe me and, and they won't obey me and they're just gonna say, the Lord didn't appear to you? You ever felt that way? You have been like scared that people are gonna think you're crazy? That's what Moses is scared of right here. And I'll be honest, I, I, like I get where Moses is coming from, right? I think it's kind of hard to tell people about God. And, and, and I think it's hard to use stories when we don't have a cool story. Right? You ever felt that way? I think, I think maybe some of us Christians feel that way, like we don't have a cool story. Recently, I had a conversation with a student. I've actually had this conversation with multiple students over the past month, but just this past week, I, I was talking to a guy. And he said this. He said, how the heck am I supposed to have a good testimony, a good story, if I don't live a crazy life? Like he wasn't using, he wasn't trying to say, hey, can I go do this and that so that I, but he was saying, he was honest saying like, how am I supposed to have a good story? How are people supposed to listen to me if I've gone to church my whole life and never done anything bad? And I, really, I relate to him. I remember on my first mission trip that I ever went on, I went to Ecuador with my dad. And I remember listening to a story of a guy who was there who as a baby, his family abandoned him. He was adopted in by another homeless family, raised in a cardboard box in a street in Peru, grew up, self-educated himself, went to college, then went to Ecuador to be a missionary to the very types of people that he grew up as. And I remember listening to him like, I will never have that kind of story. We've all heard stories like that, like Chad Williams when he came and spoke and he's a Navy SEAL and his friends are passing away and he's facing gunfire. Like, how the heck are we supposed to compete with that? But here's the cool thing. God doesn't need us to have any better or worse or stranger or crazier of a story than we already have. He doesn't need anything else in our lives than what we already have and he's gonna use it. And that's what he says to Moses. In Exodus 4, 2, the very next verse, Moses saying, God, what if they don't believe me? What am I supposed to say? The Lord asked him, Moses, what's that in your hand? What's that in your hand? Moses said, it's a staff. Now notice God didn't ask him. No, notice what God asked him, sorry. Notice that he didn't say, hey, Moses, here's a magic staff that can do all these things, go and do miracles. God didn't say, okay, well, let's just wait a couple of months until you've kind of figured some stuff out and gotten ready before I send you. Like some of us think that we'll ever be fully ready to do what the Lord's gonna do. Nah. No, God didn't say any of that. God didn't give them these special abilities. God just said, hey, right now, what's in your hand? Moses, what is it that you have in your possession right now? Moses just said, it's just a staff. It's nothing special. It's just this ordinary shepherd's staff. It's a stick. It's a piece of wood. It's nothing special. It's nothing proud. It's, I'm just a shepherd. I'm a runaway uh, slave, a runaway murderer. I've turned shepherd. I, I tend to sheep every single day. It's nothing special. That's what I have. And you say, I, I got to ask you something. What, what's in your hand right now? To you, it may look like a shepherd's staff. 
It may look like an ordinary high schooler's life. It may look like a Christian life. It may look like the opposite, where it's, you know, some, some people are worried that they don't have a cool enough story that they've done right their whole life. Some of you are on the opposite scale, where it's like, well, I'm doing wrong. Like, like it's like, I, I got to figure some stuff out before God's going to be able to use my life. I don't have money. I don't have influence. I don't have a story. I don't, I don't have this and that. I'm, I'm poor. My family's rich. Like, it's just, there's so many things that we use to look at our lives and say, God's not going to be able to use this. And it's interesting, if you're in that boat where you think you're, you're not figured stuff out, you haven't figured stuff out enough, or, you know, you're doing the wrong thing right now, that's actually what Moses had, right? Yes, in the end, God uses his story, and it's really cool, but in the moment when God's telling him this, he's actually in the process. He's still a murderer. He's still a shepherd. And Moses just says, God, it's just an ordinary staff. It's just an ordinary staff. It's nothing special. It's just an ordinary life. It's just an ordinary reputation. But let me tell you something, that same exact staff, that ordinary piece of stick was and ended up being the staff that God used to turn the Nile into blood, that God used to lead the people out of Egypt, that God used to rain down heavenly food in the desert, that God used to split the Red Sea, that God used to shepherd people through the desert, through the wilderness, into a land flowing with milk and honey to establish the nation of Israel in the place that we know it now. See, the crazy thing is, it was just an ordinary staff when Moses had it until God took a hold of it. God's gonna do that with you. God's gonna use that ordinary stick, that ordinary life, that ordinary situation that you're in to do extraordinary things in other lives, just like that stick, just like that shepherd staff that was just a piece of wood that turned into something that performed miracles. God's going to use your ordinary, normal, simple life, messed up life, perfect life, whatever it is. He's going to use it to do extraordinary things in others' lives. This mission that God is sending you on to tell others about him, you don't need anything that you already have. That you don't already have, I'm sorry. You don't need anything else. You're equipped. That's the second thing you need to know. With this job that God's sending you to do, you are equipped. You have exactly what you need. Who knows if you go into class one day and you finally step into that boldness that God's equipping you for, just like we talked about in Deuteronomy earlier, and, and accept the fact that God is with you and you accept the job that God's given you, and you go and you talk to that person who's next to you in class, who you've sat next to, you know, all year long, or you text that person who's been in your life for so long that you just really never reach out to, and you know what they're going through, and you just say, hey, how you doing? I went through it too. I'll be honest with you, it's really tough for me to talk about it because I'm not really open about it yet, but the truth is, is I've kind of started going to church and, and I heard this song that we sang and it's so powerful and it's so good and it talks about freedom and surrendering things to God. I know God may sound weird to you, but when I sang the song and I meant it, it really just opened me up and it really opened the doors a lot and it kind of took some stress that I have about this anxiety that we, you and I are both going through and it really just kind of lifted off my shoulders and then Pastor Sawyer spoke about this topic and it really hit me hard and honestly, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of broke down in my seat right now. I didn't want anyone else to see me but I kind of broke down because the words that he was saying, it felt like he was speaking straight to me and I kind of felt bad, but at the same time, it meant so much to me because it was so true and so real. And honestly, I kind of started to experience a little bit of freedom about it. And then I got plugged in one of those life groups that he talked about and it was really weird and really uncomfortable at first. And I'm not gonna lie because I don't like talking about my problems and let people into my life and knowing and letting them know what I'm going through and all that stuff. But then all of a sudden, I just kind of said one thing and it, yeah, I don't even know what happened, but so much weight was lifted off my shoulders. Like I told him, honestly, guys, um, I struggle with anxiety a little bit and I have anxiety attacks every night and um, I, can't, I can't go through a day without kind of breaking down. It's really been tough. And then all of a sudden when I said that, two or three more girls said, you know what, actually me too. I go through that same thing and I can't stop scratching my arm and I can't stop cutting myself. And, I can't do it. and all of a sudden I realized I wasn't the only thing. All of a sudden I started to re receive more freedom, receive more. And all of a sudden I feel so much better right now and I'm not perfect. I'm not, you know, I'm still struggling with anxiety, all this stuff. But all of a sudden I have people in my life going through it and I have a God that I can rely on. And I see it's really made a difference. And I just want to let you know because I know what you're going through is really tough. And, and I didn't have anyone to reach out to me. I was going through it, but here I am. I'm here for you, and I want to. I want to pray for you, and maybe you can come to church with me this weekend. And all of a sudden, you're doing your job. So easy. It's not about you being perfect. It's not about you having it figured out. It's just about you recognizing what God is doing in your life, in your ordinary, normal, chaotic, crazy life, and just talking to someone about it. You're equipped with exactly what you need. By the way, you can grow in that. 
right? You're, you're equipped as you are, but if you're kind of nervous about that and you don't know what you're saying, you can grow in it. Second Timothy, uh, Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says this. It says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is one of the most common verses in the Bible. But then it says this, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. We're already equipped with the things that we need, but if you wanna grow in your qualification in what you're gonna be able to say to someone and the tools that you have in your belt, go ahead and start memorizing the verses. Just like that book that I have memorized, I can't tell you how many times I've been talking to someone just like that situation that I was telling you about, where I, like we're just talking about random things and all of a sudden one of those verses pops in my head. I say, you know, I actually memorized this Bible verse and it really helped. And they're like, you're a Christian? I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian. They're like, I haven't been to church in forever. Maybe I should come. And all of a sudden they're at church with me. Do that. You're equipped. Okay, so how do I do that? How do I turn this life into the life that God's gonna use? How do I use my life to tell others about him? How do I use my story? How do I take what I have right now, this ordinary staff, and step into that boldness that you're talking about? Sorry, well, it's a two-step process. I'm closing up here, so, so stay with me. It's a two-step process, and I'm gonna give you the second step first, and you'll see why in just a second. But I believe that if you follow these two steps, you're gonna see that your life will easily become a tool for leading people to Christ. Regardless of what your life looks like, regardless of what season you're in, regardless of who you are, I believe that if you follow these two steps, your life is gonna become something that will lead others to Christ. Your story, your experience with God is gonna lead others to Christ. And you're gonna start to realize that your life is more meaningful and purposeful than ever before. Because you're gonna be living out your purpose, just like we talked about last week. You're gonna be living out the job that God put you here to be, to do. If you're not happy with your life right now, you can go to seminars, you can watch TED Talks, you can do all these different things, you can watch life hacks on Instagram, all you want, but I guarantee you that this is a faster and better and longer lasting way to find happiness in your life because you'll be living out your purpose. You'll be fulfilling your purpose. And it starts by this. It starts by simply looking for God in every single area of your life. Look for God in every area of your life. Sorry, you just told me that my purpose is to tell others about him. How, how does looking for him help me? I know that he's invisible, right? I know he's at church. I can tell he's there when, whenever we go to church at H7 and we sing, you know, parade or we sing, you know, you are good. Come on, we all know that song. Cause all praise him in the morning. I have a terrible voice, but it's still so good. Cause he's faithful through the evening. I love that song and we feel him when we sing stuff like that. So we know that God's at church, but let me tell you some God's in more areas of your life than just on Sunday mornings. And the more that we start to look for him in those areas, the more that we start to look for him at school and on our sports teams and in our families and at dinner and in random and trials when we're in it, whatever it is, the more we're gonna start to see him and feel his presence in those areas. And that's what Jeremiah 29, 13 says. So that we will seek him and find him when we seek him with all of our hearts. So the more that you look for him, the more that you're gonna see him. And the more that we see him and the more that we recognize his love and the things that he's done for us and the things that he's doing for us and the ways that he's in our lives that we haven't realized before, the more that we're not gonna be able to help but to tell others about it, the more that it's gonna just make us itch and say, I gotta tell you about what's going on in my life. I gotta tell you about what God's doing. I gotta tell you about this freedom that I've experienced this past week because it's crazy and you gotta hear it. I know you're going through the same thing and I know you need some help because I did too, but guess what? I found it and it's worth going to church. It's worth giving your life to the Lord because it's powerful and it got me out of it. The more that you look for God in your areas of your life, the more you're gonna see it, the more your life's gonna become something that God's gonna use. When we take a second to begin and grasp his full, unfailing, unconditional, unequivalent love that we're not gonna be able to experience anywhere else, the love that sent Jesus, that sent God himself and his son to die for me when I didn't forgive it. And what that did for me and made me a new creation, just like 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about, how on earth am I not supposed to talk about that? How the heck am I supposed to go a day without talking about how good my God is? You ever wanna have a conversation with me about something and me not bring God into it? Sorry, it's not gonna happen. I'm just warning you now, I bring God into pretty much, if not every single conversation that I have because I see God in every area of my life. I see him in the people of my life. I see him in the places. I see him in my job. I see him in my trials. I see him when I'm going to sleep and I can't fall asleep and I say, God be with me and he gives me peace. I see him in every, I see how he delivered me from the seasons that I hated and how he used them to prepare me for today. I hated being stuck at college. I was so ready for another season and God used it to prepare me for today. 
I see how he's given me favor and peace among people that I don't deserve to have favor and peace about. I see how he's given me the Holy Spirit to always be with me so that I'm ready, I'm equipped, I'm good to go so that I know that no matter how alone I feel, I'm not alone. I see how he's given me family and friends and people in my life who may not be perfect and I may not agree with at all times and I love my family and I love my new in-laws and I love my friends and I love all that. At the same time though, I don't always agree with them but at least he's given me someone. I see how he's beautiful how he's given me this beautiful state to live in, even if I don't really fit in or agree. In fact, I'm actually wearing skinny jeans for the first time and I honestly hate them because I don't fit in here. It's dry, it's, 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 it's the desert, but at least it's home and I have a place where I have purpose and meaning. I mean, when I just take a second and just think about what God's done for me and I start to look for him in every area of my life, in the areas that I've been complaining about, in the areas that I've been thankful for, in the areas that I've just kind of been passive about. When I start to look for him there and see him, I can't help but talk about it because his love compels me to. I can't hold it in because my life isn't mine, it's his. And that's step two or step one or whatever it is. You gotta give your life to him. You just gotta give your life to him. I mentioned to you earlier a moment where God used the staff that Moses had in his hand and I drew the comparison to our lives, to life itself, and how God will use our ordinary life to do extraordinary things. I wanna look back at that moment for a second. I wanna look at the language that Moses uses to describe the staff. Because in that moment, when God points out to Moses what he's gonna use, Moses says, God says, what's in your hand? Moses says, it's my staff, it's my life. It's my, it's my friends, it's my family, it's my money, and I need it now. A little J.G. Wentworth commercial for you right there. But in the very same chapter, we see Moses go to Egypt. He obeys God. He takes that step of faith and does the thing that he's calling, that God's calling him to do. He talks to that person. He talks to Pharaoh. He talks to his classmate. He talks to his sister, talks to his brother, whatever you want to say. And look at what happens. Look at the language that Moses uses to all of us and explain this staff. Exodus 4.20. So Moses took his wife and his sons and he put them on a donkey and he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took God's staff in his hands. Moses took God, in just a couple of verses, it turned from my staff into God's staff. It turned from my life into God's life. And that's when Moses started to make a difference. The moment that Moses surrendered what he had and said, no longer is this my staff, it's God's staff. Just because it's in my possession doesn't make it mine. That's when his life turned from a runaway murderer turned shepherd into the guy who God used to deliver a nation of slaves into a land flowing with milk and honey. I don't know who's watching this. I think it's safe to say that God is not calling you to go to Egypt and turn the river into blood. But I do know that God's calling you. I do know that he's calling you to give your life to him right now. No, no needing to sh- straighten out your lives. No need to get better in this area, that better. No, but just to say, God, here's my staff. Here's my life. It's yours. That's what God's calling you to do. And I know someone's watching this right now and you're not maybe ready. You don't feel ready. You don't feel like you're good to go. But God's calling you to. I don't know who's watching this. I don't know what kind of season you're in. I don't know what kind of life you've lived. I think it's safe to guess that God's not calling you to go to Egypt and turn the Nile into blood. But I do know that God's calling you. He's calling you to say, God, here's my staff. Here's my life. I give it to you. I need you. You might not be a murderer, but you're a sinner. God, I give you my life. You might not be a shepherd, but you're a student. God, I give you my life. You not, might not be the most perfect person in the world, but God's calling you to give your life to him. And it's worth it. And it'll add purpose. And it will take away all of that weight that's on your shoulders because you're forgiven and redeemed and renewed. And all of a sudden, you're able and you're equipped to go out to use the story of your life to make people understand what you've gone through and to experience it for themselves. You get to go out and say, you know what, I wasn't perfect. I'm still not perfect. You know what, I was in pain. 
I was in misery. I was stuck in addiction. And all of a sudden, God's calling me to give my life to him, and I don't feel like I'm worthy or ready, but I took a step of faith, and I did, and let me tell you something, the best decision I've ever made, and all of a sudden, you have a story to tell. All because you just said yes to God. You just said, God, here's my staff. So right now, if that's you, I want you to bow your heads and, and repeat after me. Right there in your home, don't feel ashamed. You're ready to do this. Just say, Father God, I need you. Come into my heart. Make me new. Forgive me of my sins. Make that commitment right now. Say, God, I give you my life. I give you my staff. I am yours. I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. HSM, that is the best decision that you've ever made. And if you made that decision tonight, I am so, so, so excited for you. You have a couple of next steps to get baptized is one of them, which by the way, we can still do in quarantine if you feel led to do that. Or to join a life group, you're not alone. If you feel like you have a lot of stuff going on in your life and you're ready to talk about it, you can go to a life group. You don't have to, we're not gonna press you into talking or whatever, but it helps to be around people and we have them going on right now. Or it's really just, to, to get to know us. If you want to get to know me more or Destiny, my coordinator, or my fiance, Jordan, or some of our leaders or whatever, and you just want to talk, reach out to us. But if you're ready to make that commitment, you can go ahead and text in the number that's in our comment section right below. Honestly, I don't have it memorized. I'm sorry. But text in, and we just want to be intentional with you. We just want to reach out and pray for you and celebrate your win. We're not going to throw you up on the board and say, oh, look, who gave your life to Christ? We're not going to make you feel weird or awkward or anything. We just want to be there for you and walk you through some next steps, maybe send you a Bible if you don't have one, whatever that may be. But go ahead and throw a text that number in our comment section. Best decision you ever made. I cannot wait to celebrate with you. But HSM, I love you guys. Go out, talk to someone this week about your story. Tell someone about what Jesus is doing in your life. I love you guys, and I will see you next Tuesday at 7 o'clock at HSM.